Father, we thank you for this night. We praise you for the privilege of hearing your word, serving you, and serving other people. We're asking that tonight as we come face to face with your demand in the word, that we'll make ourselves available to serve you with all our strength in Jesus' name. Amen. As you teach us, we pray that the word will be so clear to us that the word will move us into purposeful action. Action that will glorify you. Action that will fulfill your will. Do this for us, for the glory of your name, for the benefit of people around. In Jesus' name we pray. In our study of the Bible, we come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. And tonight we see Peter's extended ministry. As we look at this extended ministry of Peter, actually we're looking at principles for dynamic, effective ministry. It is true that we are not all apostles, yet there is much that each of us can learn from the life and ministry of the apostle Peter. The word of God says that Christ gave some apostles, not everybody but some, and he gave some, uh, uh, some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. From that reference, we know that we shall not all be apostles, not all prophets, not even all evangelists, not all pastors and teachers, but we all have a work to do. And whatever the Lord has called us to do, zonal leaders, area leaders, house fellowship leaders, members of the choir, ushers and cleaners and helpers, visitation workers, technicians, whatever work it may be, we need all these principles we're going to discover tonight in every one of our lives and ministries that will be effective for the Lord. Let's read this passage and have a feel of the flow of the narrative that we're reading and then be able to bring the principles out, the principles that we must see in our lives. Acts chapter 9 from verse 32. And it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Leda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Christ Jesus, makest thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Leda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and arms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber, and for as much as Leda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would come, he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that when he, ta that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon Etana. We have read of these uh, miracles that took place in the life of Peter and in his ministry. But you understand that this was not the beginning of the ministry of Peter. The question is, what kept him on? What kept him going? What kept him running? What kept him working for God, not tired? What kept his faith above the problems of life? 
and what kept his faith working after so many years of serving the Lord. Here comes the principles of the life of Peter and also of Paul and also of any other apostle and in fact also of any other person in the church that ever did anything significant for the Lord. Here are the principles. We see this in Second Peter, the second epistle general of Peter, chapter 1. From verse 12, principles you need to handle in your own life and ministry. In whatever capacity the Lord is calling you, principle you need to handle very well. Because if you are able to handle them, know them, experience them, and live in them, walk by them, you'll find that you become a dynamic, effective individual in whatever capacity the Lord wants you to serve. But you'll find if you neglect them and you know nothing about them and you do not develop them in your life, you'll just be a mediocre all through life. Now look at it. Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, Though ye know them, and be established in the present truth, yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. He had this quality in his life of personal concern. Personal concern. He looked at the believers, and he was concerned about them. And he did not want to be negligent about his responsibility of putting them in remembrance of things they needed to know, things they knew before, things they needed to be established in the present truth. Have you checked up in your life of late? Whether you are concerned for others or only concerned for yourself? Whether you are concerned about the problems of others, about the lives of others, about the things that other people need to know and need to do, and you are concerned for them and you are not negligent of your responsibility, your roles in the lives of other people, that's a quality that lifts you up above the generality of people. Personal concern for other people. Check it out. Zona leader, what concern do you have? Area leader, house fellowship leader, members of the choir, ushers, what concern do you have to contribute something significant into the lives of other people? You know, those of us who preach, those of us who counsel, those of us who pray for other people, and those of us who minister and we touch the lives of other people, there is something that keeps us going, and it is personal concern for other people. You know, the moment any of us will become selfish and self-centered, and we begin to think of ourselves, of our lives, and of our goals, uh, personal, and of what we want to achieve, apart from other people, apart from contributing something to the lives of other people, we just begin to decline, to degenerate, to go back. But you know, when you are concerned for other people, it is then you are really moving on in the life that God wants you to live to the benefit of others. So number one, personal concern. Number two, verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Now Peter was saying this. There was a time I had the opportunity to die for the Lord. I denied him. I said I didn't know him. Oh, how ashamed I was of myself. How, uh, how I felt I was a coward. How I was watching for another opportunity. But you know what? The Lord has showed me already that I will soon be putting off this tabernacle. And I can hardly wait. I'm expecting that time. When I will no more deny him. When I will no more be ashamed of him. When I will no more say I never knew him. When I will stand up and I will say I'm now standing for the truth. And then because I know I will soon put off my tabernacle. I have a sense of urgency. I know the time is short because the Lord has told me shortly, shortly, I must put off this my tabernacle, which means I must leave the world, which means I must die, which means I'll be leaving the arena of activity and I'll be going to the Lord, I'll be face to face with him. And I want to get to him, telling him I've not been negligent and I've done everything I ought to do. There is a sense of urgency upon me. You know, everybody that has ever worked for the Lord successfully, effectively, we had a sense of urgency. I know if you ever did anything significant, substantial for the Lord, you must feel that sense of urgency. I must work while yet it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. But you know, those who are working as if, well, I have a lot of time. If I don't do it today, I can do it tomorrow. 
if I don't do it this week, I can do it next week. If I don't preach uh, this time, I can preach another time. If I don't pray for people this time, I can do it another time. There is time at my disposal. You know those people, they don't feel an, a, a need and a sense of urgency. You know, they never get anything done for the Lord. And they are the people that are always pushing responsibility ahead, said, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. There's still time. I'm still young. But you know, Peter had a sense of personal urgency. And it was driving him and moving him, motivating him. Number three, he had personal experience. Look at it in verse 14. In verse 16, rather. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But why witnesses of his majesty? Now, have you ever thought of this? Sometimes you'll find some preachers. They come out to preach. And after they have preached, they come back home. And the devil tells them, do you believe all those things you are preaching? Do you really mean it? That only Jesus Christ can save? Hey, you mean all those millions of people all over the world who don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you really mean it that you believe that they are going to perish? Do you really mean it that only those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you really mean it that only those people will be saved? And you know, if you don't have personal experience with the Lord, you'll shake, you'll shake. You'll say, well, maybe, maybe, perhaps. But you know, Peter said, we have not followed cunningly devised fable. When we talked of the power of Christ, of the coming of Christ, of the majesty of Christ, we know it. And we're so sure about it. Because we were with him on the mountaintop. Let me ask you, have you been saved? You know, if you are not saved and you are preaching only Jesus can save, you are not preaching from the standpoint, from the vantage point of personal experience. Now when you say without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Actually, the Bible says follow peace with all men and holiness. Without those two things, peace and holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Do you actually believe it? Do you experience it? Are you preaching from the vantage point of experience? Now, Peter had personal experience. You know people that talk about the power of the Holy Ghost? And they say, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and they do not have that power? And you know, uh, doubts will come. Criticism will come. People will oppose you. There will be opposition. And if you are not preaching from the standpoint of experience, you know, it will shake you. But you know, Peter had experience. He knew that the Lord Jesus was the very Son of God because Jesus said, Who do men say I am? Then they told him, Who do you say I am? Do you have experience? And he said, We know who you are. You are the very Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood has not shown you this. Do you have an experience which is more than flesh and blood, more than emotion, more than feeling? Do you have something that is concrete? Are you really saved, really sanctified, and really spirit-filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost? If you are, and then you are talking and you are praying, and you are ministering, and you are counseling from the basis and the standpoint of personal experience. That man added, he saw Christ in the house, saw him on the field, saw him by the mountain, saw him on the ship, saw him on the sea, saw him in the garden, saw him on the cross, saw him when he was buried, saw him when he rose from the dead, saw him when they were all in, in one house with the door locked, and Jesus came in, and he saw him when he was showing those hands to, to Thomas, and showing all those things, saying, Thomas, don't be faithless, but believe. And he said, I know what I believe. I saw that Jesus Christ. I experienced something. And because I experienced it, I can preach it for as many years as I'm alive. You know people who have preached for five years, and they will preach a restitution and sanctification and divine healing and the power of God to cast out devils and the power of God to work the supernatural and the miracle, the miraculous. And then after five years or ten years, they say, well, uh, I don't know whether I want to believe that thing or not again. You know, they don't have personal experience. Personal experience. But Peter had, number one, personal concern. Number two, personal urgency. Number three, personal experience. But then, number four, from verse 19. We have also a much sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, 
that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He had personal knowledge. We have, we have, we have a more sure word of prophecy. The scriptures. And he said that scripture is of no private interpretation. Because he was sure, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He had personal knowledge. You know, at the end of the whole thing, you know what he wrote to the believers? In 2 Peter chapter 3, the very last verse, after he had written about many things, the coming of the false prophets, of the false teachers, of the seducers, when he had written about judgment, when he had written about the will of God, when he, when he had written about the things past and the things present and the things in future, you know how he ended? Look at chapter 3 verse 18, 2 Peter, about growing grace and in knowledge, in knowledge, in knowledge. The knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know that man, he knew the value of personal knowledge. And you know, you shouldn't live your life without the knowledge of the Bible, without the knowledge of the scriptures, because you ought to know what you believe. You have found preachers who have preached for a few years, and then after some years, they don't believe those things anymore, because there is a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge. And you have found some preachers who cannot differentiate the difference between method and message. And they confuse that a change of method means a change of message. And they have confused that if there is a, a need to adapt a, a new method, then they feel that a new method must necessarily go with a new message, a different message. And you know those people do not have the background, the basis, and the foundation of a personal knowledge. And how wonderful it is to preach the gospel with personal concern, with a sense of personal urgency, with a background of personal experience or the foundation of personal knowledge. Now come to Acts chapter 9. Let me show you some more things that was in the life of Peter and it's in the life, will be in the life of any other person that carries on a successful ministry. Now, my brother, my sister, you don't have to be an apostle to be effective. You don't have to be a prophet to be effective. You don't have to be an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher to be effective. You only just have to be what God wants you to be and you're effective. And you find out what God wants you to be. A singer, do it effectively. A counselor, do it effectively. He asked fellowship leader, do it with all your strength, all your mind. Do it effectively. But you know, if you are going to do anything effectively for the Lord, as a man, as a woman, there are just uh, four th uh, all these things you need. I've told you four things already. And I'm going to tell you more. Uh, you know, sometimes there are people who are, who are worrying about position. And they say, well, in our church, I wonder why they don't give me that position. Why they don't, gi they don't give me that position? Listen to me and see if you can understand this. It doesn't matter what label you have on an empty bottle. You may change the label on an empty bottle. That bottle is still useless to everybody on the face of the earth. And you know if we're empty, no personal concern, no sense of personal urgency, no sense of no personal experience and no background and foundation of personal knowledge. It doesn't matter what label comes upon an empty bottle. It will still be useless. You know, it's not the position, it is the condition. It is not the place you have. It is how you just present yourself before the Lord. It is not whether you are called an apostle or whether you are called a prophet or whether you are called a zona leader. It is not the label. It is not the name. It is what is in the heart you have going on for you. Personal concern. Personal urgency. I must do it now. The time is short. I must maximize my efforts in the short time that I have. That's personal urgency, personal experience, and personal knowledge. What else? Now come to Acts chapter 9. Verse 32. And it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all, the, all quarters. He came down also to the saints which dwelt at leader. You know this man was available. Available. 
You know, there was work to do in Jerusalem. He didn't. At another time, they said, there is revival going on in Samaria, and we need two people to go there. And again, you can find Peter was available. And right now, there was something going on in Lida. His attention was needed. He was available. And in verse 36, And there was a job by a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and hands this which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber, for as much as Lida was near unto Joppa, the disciples and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent unto him two men, discerning, them, discerning that he would come and not deal to come to them and Peter arose and went with them what's that he was available in another town Cornelius was having a vision and was told to send people to a place to go and call the Peter again what do you find he was available and you can check up in your Bible you can find that Peter always was available you know some people have ability they don't have availability they are able they are not available they have the strength, but they will not give the strength to the master to do the work. And you know, if you're ever going to do anything for the Lord, be available. Be available. You know, there are people that have, they make excuses. They make excuses. They can sing. Now, at this time, will you want to sing for the Lord? I would want, but they are not available. You know, the work of the usher is that, what do you think? You have the strength, you have the physique, you have the energy. What you do at this time? Oh yes, I can really do it. I have the ability, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, no chance now. They are not available. You know, we have uh, house fellowships that are breaking up and that are growing. And we need, people to, we need people to lead house fellowship. Well, I've been long in the ministry. I know I'm able. I know I can do it. Uh, but for now, I need time. They are not available. You know there are people who can preach and people who can counsel, people who can pray, but then they are not available. You know, if you are going to do anything for the Lord, I'm just telling you that you need to be available. Peter was available. Paul was available. Jesus was available. When the need called, when there was a, a matter to be settled, these people were available. No wonder God used them. Not only that. I want you to look at verse 32 again. And it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters. He came down also to the saints which dwelt at Leda. He came down to the saints. What's that? He was involved. Involved in the lives of other people. Have you known some Christians? They are saved. Sanctified. But then they are so sanctified and zealous and serious that they don't want to talk to anybody. If they talk, their holiness will come out of their mouth and they'll, they'll lose their holiness. They want to smile because if you see their teeth outside, through the holes in their teeth, their holiness will fly out. Therefore, they mustn't talk to anybody. They don't want to be involved with anybody. You know, they come to church alone. They go out of the church alone. They, they sit down in the church alone. They, they don't want to talk to anybody. If anybody is asking them, what reference did they call now? They mustn't talk. You know, because if they talk, God will be angry against them. They are just the lonely Christians and they like to live their lives alone. Where do you live? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't allow people to know that. Now, uh, can you be my prayer partner? I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I have anything to do with any other Christian. It will lower my spiritual life. I just like to, to be serious and dead serious with God. You are right. You are dead serious. Really dead. Seriously dead. And you know, these people, they will not have anything to do with any other person. No involvement. No involvement with anybody. And you know, because of that, they are not effective. They are lone rangers. You know, in a large church like this, no friend, no personal, uh, uh, no prayer partner, nobody they commune with, nobody they are following up, nobody they are helping, nobody they are caring for. They are not involved in the life of anyone. They are just alone. They live their lives alone. Nobody knows where they are. If they are sick, nobody will know. And when they die, nobody will know. Have you ever tried this? You, you have a bowl of water and you put a finger inside and you remove your finger and there is no space that is left. That is how some people are in the church. You can remove them and nobody will know that anybody has left. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. Be involved. 
be involved in the lives of other people. You know it is when you are involved in the lives of other people, you become a happy man, a happy man. Now, not only that, this man, this uh, Peter, was Christ honoring, Christ exalting. Look at verse um, 34. Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. He honored the Lord. He was saying, I do this for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the upliftment of the name of Jesus Christ, and it is in that power, in the authority of his name that I move. Jesus Christ, not me, not me. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. He was Christ honoring. You know, he didn't worry about what people said about him. You know some people, why they are not useful to the Lord? Why they are not useful to anybody? Why they can't do anything in the church? They are too concerned and too conscious of what so and so said about me. You know, when you are so busy honoring the Lord, you will not be careful as to honoring yourself. You are not careful about your reputation. All you are concerned about is the reputation of the Lord, the name of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the honor of the Lord, the majesty of the Lord. Jesus Christ, that's the center of your life. That's the totality of your life. People can tread upon you, but you manage to lift up Jesus Christ. They can crush you, but you raise up Jesus Christ. They can trample you down, but you are raising up Jesus Christ. You can even lose your face or lose your name or lose your honor. All you are concerned about is the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. Now you tell me, such a man will be useful and effective and dynamic for the Lord. He doesn't care how you criticize him. He doesn't care what to say about him. He doesn't care how you oppose him. He doesn't care if you even abuse him. All he wants to do in the midst of all the opposition is to honor Christ, honor Christ, honor Christ. And you know, if you have those things in your life, you'll be effective and dynamic. And it doesn't matter what you are doing. You may even be a cleaner in the church, a cleaner in the church. If you are available, if you are involved, if you are Christ honoring, there will be so wonderful, many wonderful things in your life. Then it was prayerful. Look at verse 40. And Peter put them all forth and kneeled now and prayed and prayed and prayed. So and turning to turning him to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. Have you ever wondered why he prayed? Uh, you know, Tabitha, that his daughters had died. And as daughters had died, they called the, the apostle. And he said, Now, Apostle Peter, we have a case here. Can you help us? And he, he sent all of them out. And then he knelt down. He knelt down. He knelt down. He knelt down. Why am I emphasizing that? Have you found some people who have had miracles in their lives? You know Peter from Acts chapter 3. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto you. Rise up and walk. That man was authoritative. Have you listened to him in, um, in uh, Acts chapter 4 as he, he came back into the people, the children of God, and they raised up their voices and they prayed and they lifted up their voice like one man, like one man praying and the place shook with the power of God and they went out and they preached with boldness. Have you seen in Acts chapter 5 when he sat down and then Ananias came and Sapphira and he deceived uh, the man of God and the man of God said, uh, what do you think you are doing? Why have you kept back of the part of the prize? You have not lied unto men, but you have lied unto the Holy Ghost. And immediately that came forth out of the mouth of a Peter. That man just fell down and died. Three hours later, Sapphira came and said, and he said, Now you tell me, is it so much you sold the land? And he said, Yes. And he said, Why have you agreed together to deceive? And to lie unto the Holy Ghost. Look, the feet of them that carried out your husband, they are just around the door. They'll carry out. The woman had that and she died. That was authority. That was supernatural. Have you read in Acts chapter 5 as they were bringing the people on the streets? Just as the shadow of Peter will fall upon them so that when the shadow comes upon them, they will be healed and they were healed. And yet this man, having such authority, having such power, having such anointing, having such great manifestation of authority in his life. When they called him, he didn't say, yes, I know how to do it. I know how to do it. And just go in the power of the flesh. He knelt down. You know some people who will never kneel down because there's so much power in their lives. You know there is a time to stand. There is a time to sit. 
But then there is a time to honor God and just come before him and bow and bend low and just kneel down in prayer before the holy God in heaven. And he knelt down and he prayed. I want to tell you that he was prayerful. He was prayerful. You won't ever find anybody that will do anything significant for the Lord for a long time. Anything that will stand the test of time and the test of eternity who is not prayerful. Peter was and then he was fruitful. Have you seen in verse 35? And all that dwelt at Leda and Sharon, they saw him, they saw the miracle. And they saw the person that had been raised from a palsy and they turned to the Lord. That's fruitfulness. And then in verse 42, And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. He was fruitful. And then verse 43, And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Now, have you ever noticed uh, something? That when you, you are a great a man, a scientist, a philosopher, a great educationist, and you, are, you have a great name, a great name, and then it happens that your name is Simon. And then you see another person who happens to be a just an ordinary fellow, who labors on just a, a menial job that he does with his own hand, and uh, he also happens to be called Simon, the same name with you. Have you noticed that a uh, people, a, a professor, a great educationist, a great man, a man that uh, has a national, uh, national influence and has a national name. Everybody respects him everywhere. And he sees a, a namesake who is just uh, somebody just walking with their hand. Uh, you know, they don't like to associate. They don't even like to be, they don't like to hear that that other person is called Simon. When they, the professors, are called Simon. But you know, Simon Peter. He found this other man called Simon, and he was a tanner. Who is a tanner? Somebody walking with the skin of dead animals to make bags, to make portmanteau, and to just make some vessels, some bottles in those days. That was the work he did. This man was free from prejudice. Not only that. You know, in Israel, among the Jews, to them it was a dirty thing. It's something that was defiling, that you will touch a dead animal. And you know, before you could take the skin of the animal and be a tanner, you'll be touching those animals that were dead. But you know this Simon? He had something. What was it? There was no prejudice in him. There was this humility in the life of this individual. Oh, it's wonderful. That no matter how the Lord is using you, you have this humility. And even though you have a namesake uh, who is just uh, doing a menial job, you know, you're able to identify. He even lived many days in the house of that man. That's wonderful. Now, I've told you ten things about the life of Peter. And all these things must be in your life, whether you're apostle or prophet, evangelist or teacher or pastor. Or you're just a house fellowship leader, just a member of the choir, just uh, an usher, or just a cleaner in the church, or just somebody counseling, just somebody praying for other people. All this must be in your life, personal concern, a sense of personal urgency, and personal experience with the Lord, and personal knowledge, availability and being involved and Christ honoring and Christ exalting prayerful, fruitful and you must be free from prejudice now broadly let us now look at the passage I've just looked at principles from the passage and I want to really study the passage with you and look at what the Lord did through Peter the Apostle and we're going to look at this broadly under two um, subheadings miracles from Christ and multitudes for Christ. Miracles from Christ. Let's see, from verse 32. And it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Leda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, makest thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. That was a miracle. That miracle came from Christ and it came through Peter. But it came from Christ. From Christ. Never forget it. 
that every miracle that is done in the name of Jesus, that miracle is coming from Christ. It may be coming through a man of God, or coming through an apostle, or coming through a minister of the gospel, or coming through a believer, but it is coming from Christ, through a vessel unto the person who needs the miracle. And this was a miracle from Christ, the healing of the lame man. Palsy. It was a terrible thing. And for eight years, the man had been sick. Perhaps he never hoped he could ever walk again. Perhaps he never hoped he could ever be able to do anything for himself again. But then Peter came to leader. And he said, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, makest thee whole. Christ and make thy bed. And the miracle took place immediately. And he arose immediately. Now, talking about miracles, sometimes because of all the things that are taking place in this church, the miracles, many people do not understand that they still, we still need to study the Bible. You know, it fascinates me as I study the Bible. And I see that God is not tied to a particular method all the time. You know that this was not the first time that uh, Peter was going to be used of God in making somebody who had been lame to rise up and to walk. But you know what fascinates me? It's different every time. It's different every time. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, I'll just remind you of what happened. Peter and John were coming to the temple and at the beautiful gate they saw this man. And you know what he said? Silver and gold have I known. But what I have, I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And then he stretched forth his hand. He pulled the man up by the hand. And the man jumped up and started walking. But you know here, it was different. He didn't, receive, re, he didn't repeat the same formula. Have you seen these books before? Formula for healing the sick. There is no formula. It's by the Spirit of God. Are you seeing books like Formula for Raising the Dead? There is no formula. It is by the Spirit of God. Hey, don't let anybody deceive us. As if there is a formula. Do this, 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 and that, and the lame will rise. Nothing like that. It's not a formula. It's by the leading of the Holy Ghost. It's by faith in Christ. It's by confidence in the Word of God. And it is by power in the Holy Ghost. Those four things. Those four things. Faith in Christ. Confidence in the word of God, power in the spirit, and the leading of the Holy Ghost. The leading of the Holy Ghost. And so you see, here he said, Christ Jesus maketh thee whole. Now suppose, my brother, my sister, we're learning a formula, and we have learned days today, how to make a person that is lame rise up and walk, and we all uh, learn the memory verse. And yes, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. Now, repeat that after me. And yes, Christ Jesus maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. Again, and yes, Christ Jesus maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. Now suppose we learn that as memory verse and then you are going back home and you see a man that was lame uh, you know on the side of the road and you say uh, lame man what's your name and he says uh, my name is Gabriel and you say Gabriel Jesus Christ maketh thee whole arise and make thy bed and you read the memory verse well the man just jump up it's not a formula it's not a formula is by the power of the Spirit. That's what I'm telling you. Hey, you know, people who don't study the Bible and they think that, well, I've seen it done before. I've heard how it was said before. I know the formula. And they just get disappointed. And you know, this miracle took place because of these uh, four things I've told you of. And it's there on your outline. And you know, as we develop ourselves, as we develop our faith, as we get in the word, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. 
And then another miracle that took place. Look at it in verse 30, from verse 36. Now there was a Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and arms deeds, which she did. Before I go on, let me just put this in. Some people are waiting, saying, well, nobody has given me work to do in the church. If they gave me work to do in the church, I will do it. There is so much work to do. Your problem is laziness. Nobody gave Dockers any work to do, but she made coats for those widows, clothes for the needy, for the naked, and she was full of good works and arms deeds. That was her lie. That was her lie. And according to... Um, Proverbs chapter 31 verse 20, that's the work of a virtuous woman. And if a woman in the church, there is so much work to do. You don't have to be told, cleaning up the church, cleaning up the benches in the church, that's work to do. And giving a helping hand in, the, in your community to members of the church, that's great work to do. And you can just get involved in the lives of other people in the church and helping them and caring for them and being of help in one way or the other. You know, somebody has just put to bed as a new child and you know how to wash babies. You just go there and you just help them. Somebody's sick and you know how to help them to be able to get hot water. You just do it for them. Arms, deeds, and good works. You know, you don't have to be called a apostle before you really work for the Lord. There is so much to do. And at this time of the crusade, there is much for everybody to do. And let me go on. Verse 37. And it came to pass in those days that she was saved and died. That's Dockers. Whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. For as much as Lida was nigh or near or close to Joppa, the disciples and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. But Peter, and then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body said Tabitha arise and she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter she sat up is that not a miracle that's a miracle now, now that miracle took place that miracle took place now I want you to understand this it's good that you belong to a church where you are taught the Bible. Because if we are not taught the Bible, many of us will just, uh, you know, go out of hand and do things that are not according to the word of God. And I've, talk, I've told you about these two miracles. These miracles are so wonderful. These miracles are so essential. Number one, the person that was lame. Number two, the person that was dead. Now, let's just look at these two miracles. For the time being, there are people that in their lives they do not want to do anything the Lord wants them to do. All they're saying is, Oh Lord, what I want to do, I just want to be able to heal the sick to the point that if somebody is lame, I just tell him, Arise, and he begins to walk. If somebody is dead, I say, Arise, and then he, he rises from the dead. That's all I want. And if somebody has a dick, they don't want to pray for that. That's too small. You know what the Bible says? Despise not the days of small beginning. You know, if somebody has a stomach problem, they don't want to pray for that. You know what the Bible says? Despise not the days of small beginning. If somebody has lost his job and he says, My brother, come, let us agree together. Because the Bible says, If we shall agree as touching anything, the Lord will do it. Now let the Lord do it for me so that my joy will be full. Oh, they say, I'm sorry, I don't want to pray for such a thing. All I'm looking for is I'll be able to raise the dead and I'll be able to heal somebody that is lame. Despise not the days of small beginning. Start where you are. Start with the headache. Start with the little pain. Start with the stomach problem. Start with whatever it is, however small. Start with it and let your face go to work. 
and begin to realize miracles on a small scale like that, and then you can go on to a greater, a, a greater level. But then look at me. What proportion of the world is lame? Very small percentage, very small percentage, very small percentage. And you know, if all that you want to do is just uh, taking care of the people that are lame, you know, all these testimonies we're hearing every Thursday when we come. Somebody who has been pregnant for six years and the Lord is doing that. You know, some people don't want that type of miracle. You know what the Lord is? Somebody who has been poisoned, they don't want that type of miracle for the Lord to deliver them. Somebody who has been a leper for 20 years for the Lord to cleanse them, they are not impressed by such miracles. All they're looking for, they just want to, they want to find a dead person somewhere and raise that person from the dead. That's what they want, and that's why they want to start. And they will never do anything until they do that, and they will never do anything because they will never do that. And now you know, you understand this. Now let me show you this. In our lives, God will use us in the way, in the way he wants to use us. And now let me concentrate on raising the dead. Because church, this is an area where we don't understand. Somebody ran to me many years ago. And uh, somebody had died. The person was not even a believer. And this person was old, the grandmother of somebody. And uh, this uh, young man came to me and he said, My uh, brother, in fact, it, uh, she was his own grandmother. Said, uh, Excuse me, sir, my grandmother is dead. And uh, I've come to call you. I know that uh, if you'll just follow me and will pray for that uh, grandmother, she will rise up. Grandmother. And I said, uh, when we go, what Bible passage are we going to take along? Because I remember Elijah raising the dead, and that person was a boy. I remember Elisha raising the dead, and that person was a boy. And I remember that when Elijah, when Elisha died, and they were taking about, they were taking away a man, and they dropped him there. They were going to bury that man, and that man just touched the bones of Elisha, and he rose up, and that man was a young man. And I remember Jesus Christ raising the dead, and I see that in the house of Jairus, it was a daughter, twelve years of age. And I remember that Jesus Christ, as he came into the city of Nain, there was a widow there, and the mother was still alive, but the son was being carried out. That was a young man. And I remember that Lazarus also was just a brother to Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary themselves were just young women. They were just less than 40 years of age. And their brother was less than 40 years of age. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And I remember that this Dorcas also was just a woman uh, full of good works, still active, still powerful. Not an old woman that all the teeth, all the teeth were totally gone and they were grinding the meat for her uh, to chew. No, just a young woman. And I remember that when Paul raised the dead, it was Eutychus, a young man that was, you know, young enough to see it on the window when Paul was preaching. Because if he, if he was an old man, they wouldn't have allowed him to, to sit on the window because uh, the Bible has instructed them, you must stand up before the hoary head, before somebody having gray hair. And they knew the Bible enough, they would allow the man to sit down. But that man was a young man, he sat on the window. And while Paul was preaching, he fell down, he died. And Paul went there, he raised him from the dead. Now you tell me, where is the Bible passage for raising up a grandmother? You know, we must study the Bible. We must study the Bible. And uh, apart from that, uh, you know the time that they raised up the dead? You know, because you find the believers, house fellowship leader, and somebody has, you know, somebody died somewhere, and the house fellowship leader has never prayed for headache to go, has never prayed for toothache to vanish away, has never prayed even for a pregnant woman to deliver, has never prayed for any other thing. You know the first miracle he wants to perform as fellowship leader? He wants to raise the dead. Now you follow me. Elijah, when he raised the dead, was that the beginning of his ministry? No. You know, Elijah had been having power with God because he had prayed years before that there would be no rain and there was no rain. 
and he had also been staying by the brookside and that man was saturated by the promises of God for all that one year and had come into the house of that widow woman and had stayed a long time there and he had, he had no other job he wasn't preaching he wasn't doing any other thing he was only praying and waiting upon the Lord all those days and miracles were taking place the barrel of oil and the barrel of meat did not fail those were miracles through his ministry it was after all that the boy died and now he had grown, grown in his faith matured in his faith he prayed and that boy rose up you know it wasn't the beginning of his ministry look at Elisha Elisha had received the double portion of the spirit after receiving the double portion of the spirit he came to him and he said the situation of this city is good but the water is bad and he said bring me a cruise of oil and a cruise of salt and they gave to him he put it there he said hear the word of the Lord from this day the water is sealed and there was no more death uh, concerning that water and it was after all that now, many things are taking place if you'll check up in 2nd Kings chapter 3 now chapter 4 you'll find that he raised the dead it wasn't the beginning of his ministry finally about Jesus Christ he came to the temple and said the spirit of the Lord is upon me he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has anointed him to, to set the captives free he has anointed me to declare the, the year of um, jubilee the acceptable year of the Lord and many things were taking place many miracles blind eyes opened deaf ears opened the lame walking and rising and then later and then later the dead rose up you find it about Peter. A miracle had been performed in Acts chapter 3. Another miracle in Acts chapter 5. Miracles have been taking place in his life. And now as his face matured, his face matured, his face matured, he raised the dead. Not the beginning. You remember Paul. He raised the dead in Acts chapter 20. You know when he started preaching? In Acts chapter 9. You read, we read that last uh, Monday. And you know, he went on in his life in Acts chapter 13. Separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, unto the work I have given unto them. And they went on missionary journey. Miracles were performed. Do you remember in Acts chapter 14, he saw that man and he saw that he had faith to be healed. He said, stand up on your feet. And the man rose up. That's Paul. And then uh, when you come to Acts chapter 16, there was a, a woman with spirit of divination following after them. And he said, come out of, of her and it came out and then went to the prison they locked him up because of that and then he was singing in the night and then the Lord opened up the prison a great event happened an earthquake that was a miracle eventually in Acts chapter 20 his faith had matured his faith had grown he was now not just an apostle without experience he was an experienced matured apostle and then he raised the dead you know what I'm teaching you? I'm saying, let us start at a small place. When you are climbing a ladder, you start from the bottom and you go a step at a time, a step at a time, a step at a time. And you let us go systematically as we're praying for the sick. You know, if it is only headache, you pray for that person and let the headache come out. And then the person says, oh, I'm healed, I'm healed. And you are so happy, you are so excited because of the headache that had been healed. Don't say, well, I'm going to, if God doesn't use me raising the dead, I will never pray any other prayer. You know, start in a small place. Now, apart from all that, let me show you something. Concerning raising the dead. In Matthew Chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye are received, freely give. The question is, to whom did he say that? To the twelve apostles. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye are received, freely give. Now, um, we're studying the Bible tonight, and pay, pay attention. He told the twelve apostles that. Now, he was going to send the seventy out, and he was going to send the seventy two by two. You know what he told them? He told them, heal the sick. Wherever you go, just heal the sick. You know what he didn't say to those 70 people? He didn't say, raise the dead. That's significant. That's significant. Which means he wanted them to operate at the level of their faith. 
He wanted them to operate to the proportion of their faith. He told the 12 apostles, raise the dead. And he did not tell the 70 people, raise the dead. Because he wanted them to operate at the level, at the proportion of their faith. Now in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Verse 17. Now he was talking to the church here. And he said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Apostles believe, prophets believe, evangelists believe, pastors believe, teachers believe, believers believe, Christian workers and ministers believe, them that believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take off serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You know what is missing? Raising the dead is missing. You know, we need to study the Bible. Are you saying that nobody can raise the dead if he's not an apostle? I'm not saying that. I am saying when he gave the commission to the apostles, he specifically mentioned raising the dead. But when he gave to others, he did not. But then we have another verse, John 14 verse 12, which is broad and it is for every believer. Broad for every believer. Verily, verily, I say unto you, John 14, 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, it is not expressed there, raising the dead, but raising the dead is included in this one. Because he said, the works I do, he shall do. And that includes raising the dead. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. That includes raising the dead. But, and then it is given to whosoever. He that believeth on me, the works I do, he shall do. But then, this is just implied. It is by implication. It is not directly stated, but it is implied. That is teaching us something. It is saying, for the apostles, they were told directly, exp explicitly. For the others, it is by implication, which means we must allow our faith to develop to that level. He that believeth on me and believing on Christ has levels, heights, depths, and when we get to that depth, we believe to that point, we're able to do everything that he did. And then we continue believing, we're able to do greater works than that. But you know, we have to start at the point where we are. In Romans chapter 12, Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. You see, you have a measure of faith. Whatever that measure can do, do it. Whatever that measure cannot do, don't attempt it. Just minister, just pray for people according to the measure of faith that God has given you. Don't say, well, I've seen an apostle do it, I will do it. Are you an apostle? Don't say, well, I've seen a people raising the dead, and then you go to, you say, well, they told us that if we believe all things are possible, all things are possible to the limit of your faith to the measure of your faith, to the proportion of your faith. Why don't you try that faith on people that have it first? Why don't you try that faith on those that are looking for job first and let that faith grow and grow and grow and grow? And then when it grows to a higher level, you can do greater things. But you know, some people will not allow their faith like that to grow and they just go to the hospital and uh, they say, can I see the doctor? Are you sick? No. What do you want to see him for? Just let me see him. And eventually he sees the doctor and he says, uh, Excuse me, please. Uh, anybody died here this week? And the doctor said, Yes. What's the matter? Well, I just want to tell you that uh, I've read the Bible. And it says, If I believe all things are possible. And I want to try my faith on those dead people. Well, they're all in the mortuary. Bring them out for me. American wonder. That's not Christianity. And eventually, 
he goes in there and he prays and he prays and he prays four hours listen to me Elijah raised the dead how many hours <laughs> didn't take 10 minutes you check up the references are down your outline Elisha raised the dead how many hours didn't take him um, 10 minutes because you know if you check up Gehazi went there with the rod in his hand and he put it on the dead child and there was no movement at all because for Gehazi that was not the level of his faith Elisha came in there and it didn't take hours you know Jesus raised the dead how many hours just a short time and we're told Peter raised the dead dockers. Just knelt down and prayed. And God spoke to him. God showed him what to do. And he just rose up. The shortest prayer he prayed in his life. Tabitha, arise. Finished. And the woman opened her eyes and woke up. That's authority. But you know, people who pray for four hours, six hours, wanting to raise the dead. My brother, my sister, let's follow the Bible. Let's continue according to the measure of our faith. Now, I'm not saying that if you are not an apostle, you can't raise the dead. I've already given you the references. I'm teaching generally today. We have testimonies here of uh, the dead being raised, and it's been wonderful, and we have rejoiced and glorified the Lord for it. But, you know, we can't say because of those one, two, or three people, uh, children who are raised from the dead, because of that, we are not going to teach the Bible. You know, we need to teach the Bible so that the believers will know how to develop their faith. The believers will know how to just continue to increase their faith until it comes to a level where you'll be able to do greater things. In Acts chapter 9, let's just end up by asking ourselves, what was the result of all this? The miracles that took place. The result is that multitudes followed Christ. In Acts chapter 9, verse 35, And all that dwelt in Leda and Sharon saw him. They saw the man who was lame before who had been raised up, and they turned to the Lord. And in verse 41 to 43, And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her life. And it was known throughout all Joppa. And many, many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon Etana. People followed the Lord as a result of the miracles. Have you seen how the miracles that have been happening on Thursdays, Miracle Revival Hour, how those miracles have been drawing people to the Lord? That is what always happens. When there are genuine miracles by the name of the Lord, through confidence in the word of God, through the power of the Holy Ghost and through the leading and revelation of the spiritual gifts as led by the Lord, as it happens on Thursdays here, you know, the Lord glorifies himself and multitudes turn to the Lord. I'm praying that at whatever level of faith we are, the Lord will begin to use every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. And as the days come and go, our faith will be growing and developing and uh, will be becoming greater and better and more enriched in the word of God as the days go by. What we are not able to do today, by the grace of God, if Jesus tarries, you will be able to do tomorrow. Rise up and let us pray. Remember those qualities? Personal concern, personal urgency, personal experience, personal knowledge. You tell the Lord, you want to have all those qualities in your life. To have an effective ministry, a dynamic ministry, and then be available, be involved, be Christ-honoring, Christ-exalting, prayerful, fruitful, and free from prejudice, so the Lord can use you. Let's commit ourselves to the Lord. Apply them in your life. Begin to use your face at the point where you are. Don't wait until you can raise the dead. Use your face at the point where you are. Let the Lord be glorified. Get involved in the house fellowship. Get involved inviting people. Be available to do whatever the Lord wants you to do in the church.